right now on 5 on your side at 10. Dense fog, reducing visibilities, prompts a weather first alert day for Tuesday morning when the fog will lift. Tonight, toxic school uniforms. And these chemicals can stay in the body for months or even years. What researchers found when they tested dozens of outfits required in school dress codes. But first tonight, hunting for a new headquarters. One of St. Louis's biggest companies is looking to move. Tonight, the St. Louis region is at risk of losing one of its top corporate citizens. Good evening, I'm Ann Allred. And I'm Mike Bush. Emerson Electric employs hundreds of workers. Our Robert Townsend is live in Ferguson with reaction. Mike and Ann, tonight I talked to multiple North County residents about Emerson's decision to apparently leave Ferguson and take its headquarters elsewhere. And let me tell you, people have a lot to say. Now, a majority of folks tell us that it came as a big surprise after they heard about it on the news this afternoon. For nearly 80 years, Emerson Electric's headquarters has been located right here in Ferguson. The company makes automation products and provides engineering services to the region. Emerson currently employs about 1300 workers. It has been called an industrial giant and apparently has signed a deal to sell its climate technologies business to the investment firm Blackstone. Some say moving its headquarters outside Ferguson will be a devastating blow to this community of 15,000 people. I think that's bad because everybody already in a bunch already at trying to find a job and with them taking more jobs, it's just going to make it even more uh, worse than what it already is. I would love another company to come in. Hopefully, that would be in the, in the makings, if you know, to, so these people can keep their jobs. Now, Jason Hall, the CEO of Greater St. Louis Inc., says today he met with Emerson Electric's president. In a statement, Hall said, quote, I shared with him our belief that the St. Louis Metro continues to be the location, the best location for Emerson's future and that Greater St. Louis Inc. would immediately begin working with partners to make that case as the company goes through its process. Now, I also reached out to Ferguson Mayor Ella Jones tonight, and Jones tells me she only received few details from Emerson, and she says she hopes to learn more, much more, when she meets with company officials on Thursday. Of course, we're going to stay on this. We're live in Ferguson. I'm Robert Townsend. Five of your side. A live look at the St. Louis wheel on Halloween night. A cool, damp, and foggy evening for trick-or-treaters. And that fog isn't letting up for some parts of our viewing area. Let's get over to Chief Meteorologist Scott Connell with a weather first alert. Yeah, we are talking about an alert day for tomorrow. Visibility's already dropping off in some spots down below a quarter of a mile, and that's really the threshold where you have to start slowing down and driving speeds have to be reduced because the visibility gets well, you can't just see. So you're down a quarter mile in Belleville, the Perryville airports there as well. Now Salem over towards Centralia, Effingham, Litchfield. We've had pockets here, mainly east of St. Louis, where the visibilities have been around an eighth to a quarter of a mile pretty consistently here over the last couple of hours. So the dense fog advisory, it is for our Metro East counties, and that's why we have a weather first alert day for tomorrow morning. That quarter mile or less visibility means tomorrow morning. It's probably going to take a little longer for your morning commute. The fog will be lifting after the rush hour and then otherwise a warm start to November. We'll get into more of that in a few minutes, Mike. All right, Scott, it's been one week since a former student stormed into Central Visual and Performing Arts High School in St. Louis and opened fire. Today, one of the two victims killed in the attack was laid to rest. Hundreds filled the pews at the Cathedral Basilica of St. Louis this morning to celebrate the life of health and PE teacher Jean Kushka. Her students say her last few moments in the classroom were spent protecting them from the gunmen. Kushka's family says she dedicated more than half her life to teaching St. Louis area children. Mom believed every child is a unique human being and deserves a chance to learn. After teaching for 18 years at Seven Holy Founders, she spent the past 20 years at St. Louis Public School District. Though the spark that led her there wasn't gone, Mom was looking forward to retiring soon. She was ready to spend more time with the people she loved. Along with a long teaching career, Jean was remembered and honored for her tireless work to raise awareness for juvenile diabetes after her son Joe was diagnosed at a young age. 
The student killed in the attack, Alexandra Bell, will be laid to rest this weekend. Her funeral is Saturday at Faith Church in Earth City. The search continues tonight for a missing paraglider in Franklin County. Kenny Loudermilk was last seen on October 26th. Witnesses say they saw him crash into the Missouri River near Highway 47. There have been water searches every day since then, but there's been no sign of him. There is a GoFundMe for his family. We have more information in the As Seen on TV section of KSDK.com. Tonight, police are searching for one of the four men accused of stealing a BMW in Sunset Hills this morning. The group was chased by the victim's son through the car's GPS. He then rammed his car into the stolen BMW near Big Ben and 64 in Richmond Heights. The victim's suspect shot at the, the sorry, the victim shot at the suspects rather, hitting one of them in the leg. We don't know what caused him to do that. Don't know if it was, you know, him responding to having guns pointed at him, but we do know that these people were armed because we recovered some of their weapons. The three other suspects ran off. Two of them were arrested. It's unclear whether the victim's son could be charged with a crime. Well, Election Day is one week from tomorrow, and one of the biggest issues on the Missouri ballot, whether to legalize recreational marijuana. But prominent leaders in both major parties are urging people to vote against Amendment 3. Our political editor, Mark Maxwell, is here to explain why. Mike, the in, uh, insiders in the medical marijuana industry love this plan. It keeps them first in line and makes it harder for new competitors to get in. But get this, conservative politicians like Jay Ashcroft and Mike Parson are joining forces with liberal Democrats like Cori Bush and Tashara Jones to campaign against Amendment 3. That has us prompting, uh, asking this question on Halloween night. Is it a trick or a treat? Amendment 3 is, a, is very much a treat. I think it's a treat. It's a trick, not a treat. House Republican Ron Hicks supports legal marijuana. If alcohol is legal, why is this not? But he strongly disagrees with baking this plan into the state constitution. If they tomorrow lifted it as a Schedule One drug, but yet we passed this, it would be in our Constitution as an illegal drug, but yet everywhere else it's not. If you have more than three ounces on you, that's illegal. Hicks argues true legalization would remove limits on which businesses can sell it and how much you can buy. There's no limit on how much beer I can put in the bed of my truck. It should be the same for this. As long as you're within the possession limit, uh, there is no possibility of, uh, and you're over 21 years of age, uh, there is no possibility of any kind of uh, subject, you know, discipline from the state. John Payne works for the campaign to pass Amendment 3 and says it would legalize sales in the future and forgive crimes committed in the past. And that is something that uh, Amendment 3 would do is automatically expunge the records for people with uh, minor marijuana offenses uh, with the exception of sales to minors, driving under the influence, and any offense involving violence. Missouri police arrest roughly 20,000 people a year on suspicion of possessing marijuana. Medical dispensaries can only sell to the state's 200,000 patients with a medical card right now. And the more we grow, the cheaper it gets. Tom Bomarito predicts legal recreational cannabis could triple his customer base and help his company recoup the funds he invested to get it up and running. Okay, once we get to rec, that makes most of these stores from losing money to maybe making some money. So the, sta the industry will stabilize. More growers will put on more weight, so prices will come down. But if you ask the people working behind the counter, so that's actually going to be uh, a little more mellow. The marijuana market has power to do more than just boost a bottom line for a business or the state. Um, we're helping people break 40-year prescription painkiller habits. Charlie Unger says cannabis can offer an alternative that might even save lives. But my generation, um, it's no secret, um, I'm from St. Louis County, and the amount of funerals that I have been to from people that were pushed into opioid dependency is, is staggering. How soon could legal recreational marijuana get here if voters approve it? February 7th, some business owners say. They also point to polling showing support hovering around 55 percent. Voters no longer have to wait until Election Day to cast their ballots. This is the first year of no excuse absentee voting in Missouri. Early voting is also underway in Illinois. Our verified team looks into claims on how those votes are counted. Here's Brandon Lewis. Every state offers absentee ballots, which allow you to vote by mail, either with or without an excuse, depending on where you live. But according to Vote.org, one claim that it hears all too often is that absentee ballots are only counted in tight races. So let's verify using these sources. 
All election officials are required to count every eligible ballot according to the Federal Voting Assistance Program, regardless of whether you vote in person or absentee. The U.S. Vote Foundation says some of the misconceptions stem from when races are called early for a candidate. This happens when it's not mathematically possible for their opponent to win. So even if you know the result, those absentee ballots are still counted in the final tally. Plus, there are many races on a single ballot. So just because one is a slam dunk for a candidate doesn't mean that's the case for another. So no, absentee ballots are not only counted in close races. With your Verify, I'm Brandon Lewis. What can we verify for you? Send an email, verify at ksdk.com. As part of our mission to stand up for St. Louis, we ask you to vote either early or on Election Day. A reminder, it's Tuesday, November 8th, which is one week from tomorrow. There's a lot on the ballot. We've made it easy for you to know what you're voting for. Our voter guide has detailed information on the candidates and issues in both Missouri and Illinois. There's also information on early voting, Election Day hours and requirements. Just text the word guide to 314-425-5355. We'll send you a link. And join us election night for expanded results and analysis. Our coverage will begin as soon as the polls close at 7 p.m. on 5 Plus and on KSDK.com. Then stick around for an expanded edition of 5 on your side at 10. Well, tonight it's official. Sounds of Caw Caw will fill the dome in the spring. Today, the XFL announced its team in St. Louis will keep its Battle Hawks name from the last incarnation of the league, which folded because of the pandemic. Local apparel stores say fandom for the team never wavered. We kind of stopped a bit of production on when the team wasn't playing anymore because it just seemed like, oh, well, sales might slow down. People might ne necessarily want something if they're not going to a game. But if people surprised us, they still wanted stuff, which has been really fun. The Battle Hawks are hosting a town hall tomorrow at Ballpark Village, and they're already taking deposits on season tickets on their website. Answers tonight in the murder mystery of two Indiana teenagers. I don't feel like I thought I would. Tonight, the arrest nearly six years in the making, plus the encounter one victim's family had with the alleged killer. Toxic threads, the danger facing many students before they head for their bus stop. Dense fog building back into parts of the metro area. The dense fog advisory, mainly east of the Mississippi River. We're talking about when that fog lifts, how low the visibilities will be, and the weekend ahead. Tonight, answers for two Indiana families haunted for the last five and a half years about the gruesome murders of two teenage girls. Finally, there's been an arrest in the case. The judge did find probable cause for an arrest of Richard Allen. He's been charged with two counts of murder for the murder of Abigail Williams and Liberty German. Those two girls vanished while hiking on a trail outside their hometown of Delphi, Indiana. Their bodies were found the next day. Libby German took photos and recorded audio of their killer before they were murdered. Her grandparents, Mike and Becky Patty, say they still don't have closure. I've always said that I would be screaming on the rooftops, but we're not. It's, it's sad. I want to make sure that we have everything we possibly need and more. I don't want to leave any stone unturned. The suspect, Richard Allen, lived in the small town and worked at the local CVS. After the murders, Becky Patty says Allen processed photos for her and didn't charge her. More testing will be done this week at Jana Elementary over radioactive contamination concerns. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers will begin soil testing on Wednesday. Structure investigations were completed last week. Results are expected to take two weeks. A school board meeting will be held tomorrow night. A final decision could be made on separating Jana students into five other school buildings. Some students could be exposed to potentially dangerous chemicals before they even leave the house in the morning. Tonight, Consumer Reports looks into the fabric of some school uniforms, which could be loaded with forever chemicals. Millions of children wear them every day, school uniforms. And according to a recent study published in the Journal of Environmental Science and Technology, those uniforms had higher levels of potentially dangerous PFAS chemicals 
than other types of children's clothing tested, such as bibs, hats, and swimsuits. PFAS are known as forever chemicals since they essentially never break down naturally. And they're often added to products to make them waterproof, stain resistant, or non-stick. In recent years, PFAS have been linked to a growing list of health problems, including increased risk for certain cancers, liver damage, and neurodevelopmental problems. And children's exposure is of particular concern. In this study, 30 stain resistant school uniforms were tested and the chemicals were found in all of them. Kids wear these clothes against their skin for hours every day. And these chemicals can stay in the body for months or even years. So it's really important to limit exposure where possible. Now some states are stepping up. New York and California passed bills that phase PFAS out of textiles by 2024 and 2025. That does little to help anxious parents right now, but there are some ways to limit your child's exposure. If you have the option, say your school requires a blue polo, but not one from a specific store, try to buy one that's not labeled stain resistant, since stain resistant coatings often contain PFAS. And parents can also limit exposure from other sources, like testing their drinking water and using a water filter certified to remove PFAS, and avoiding stain-resistant carpets and home products. It might also be a good idea if ordering takeout to order from places that have phase PFAS out of their food packaging. While kids were hitting up homes for candy, adults headed to convenience stores hoping for a big cash windfall. Tonight's Powerball jackpot worth an estimated one buh, buh, billion dollars. Yes, it is the second largest prize in the game's history. Tonight's winning numbers were drawn just 15 minutes ago. They are 13, 19, 36, 39, 59. Powerball, lucky 13. Tonight is Halloween, of course. Annie Malone held its first trunk or treat. Kids showing up in their costumes for candy. There are also activities, including a magician and St. Louis Children's Hospital handed out goodie bags that included toothbrushes and floss. It was perfect timing, Scott. I'd say, what, 5.30, a little crack of sun, mm -hmm. just in time for those trick-or-treaters. But perfect. that fog, you know, that's a good mix with trick-or-treating you know, going. Yeah, we had, well, we've had the rain over the last couple of days, and, you know, as the sky started to clear this evening, you've got all that moisture that's left around the area. And so we've started seeing the dense fog develop, especially in some of the low spots here, the western parts of the metro area, but really it's been more widespread on the Illinois side. That's where our dense fog advisory is. It includes the Metro East, so all of Madison, St. Clair County. You know, the visibility's come up in the Chesterfield Valley now to a mile, but up at Smart Field, that's in northern St. Charles County, it's a quarter of a mile. We've seen the visibility around Belleville at times less than a quarter of a mile. That's where it is right now at a quarter of a mile, up 55 through Litchfield quarter of a mile. So again, that's enough where it's going to slow you down tomorrow morning. That's why we are having an alert day for Tuesday morning. It won't last very long, but just be prepared to give yourself an extra five or 10 minutes for the morning commute, because if you're coming in, particularly from Illinois, that fog could be locally dense and that's going to slow your speeds down because you simply can't see all that far. Very humid out there. 51 degrees, no wind to kind of scour out the moisture. So we are going to stay on the moist side overnight tonight. Our average high this time of year 63. We only made it to 60 today because of the cloud cover and yes, the little bit of rain that was around this afternoon will drop to around 40 in the coolest spots overnight. Again, the fog anticipated to be a bit more widespread east of St. Louis heading into tomorrow morning. Now, here's the thing. After we get the fog to lift between 8 and 10 tomorrow morning, after that, it's sunshine. It's glorious tomorrow afternoon. We are back into the lower 70s, and it's a warm start for November here. We'll be in the mid 70s through the end of the week. The thing we're watching, though, is heading towards the weekend. The potential for some heavier rain here as we head into Saturday as this system slides on in. There's even the potential for some stronger storms down into parts of maybe Arkansas. Oklahoma and Texas, not so much for St. Louis, but another healthy dose of rain certainly possible heading into the weekend, which of course helps ease the drought scenario that's across the region at this point. We've made a little dent here in the last week and a half. Dense fog for tomorrow morning, especially east of St. Louis. That's why we're having the orange alert. And then after that, it is smooth sailing for most of the rest of the week. Election day. 
We're talking a chance for a shower or a thunderstorm. We'll fine tune that as we get closer. And of course, we'll fine tune the weekend rain chances as well as that system, which is now between Seattle and Anchorage slides towards us. So we'll fine tune that over the weekend. The other thing is it's the weekend to change your batteries in your smoke detector, in your carbon monoxide detector, and roll all of your clocks back an hour before going to bed Saturday night. Those temperatures look awfully comfortable. Scott. They sure do. Yeah, thank you. Sports is next with Frank. Well, Mike, could we have a Heisman Trophy winner at Illinois? Could we have a star being born at Francis Howe? And could the Blues finally win a game? Stick around. The Blues have their longest losing streak in about four years. It's five in a row, and it's brutal. They gave up four goals to the Kings in about six minutes in the second period tonight. The team is basically the same, which recorded 109 points last season. So go figure. Midway first period, Kevin Fiala to Gabriel Velarde with the tip pass George Biddington. one nothing. Second period, Kings flying. Carl Grundstrom. Binner never had a prayer. 90 seconds later, the Blues were on the ice and providing very little resistance. It's Anze Kopitar, it's three to nothing, and this one was basically over. Coach Berube called timeout, got ticked off, didn't matter. Blues actually got booed, Blues lose, final 5-1. You know, there's 20 guys go out there, we're just not getting the job done right now, so you want to hold accountable and they have every right to, uh, you know, boo us. And it's not enough effort from our group, um, and that's the bottom line, we need to find ways to to get the energy to um, just compete. We got outworked and outskated. Not hungry enough, not desperate enough. So here's one thing I don't like. People disrespecting Illinois football because of their schedule. Are you kidding me? They're seven and one. They moved up to 14th in the national rankings. Their highest ranking in 15 years. So just enjoy the ride. And here's one of the bigger reasons. Running back Chase Brown, who had 162 total yards against Nebraska Saturday. He leads America in rushing with over 1,200 yards. If Illinois plays 14 games, he's on pace to go over 2,000. I'm a Heisman Trophy voter, and I got a feeling he should be on my ballot. Speaking of the Heisman, Coach, what do you think? Just in the last... Uh, literally the last 24 hours from, from ESPN and other groups that promote and organize that award, reaching out for information, footage, verbiage, uh, it's, it's a positive sign in the right direction. So uh, Chase Brown for Heisman and every other award, I'd scream as loud as I can. I think he's playing at a, an extreme high level. We are hoping the Battle Hawks will do the same. They're back, baby. The name will remain the same, and it should. So I asked Coach today if he thinks they can draw 28,000 a game again. Those numbers were a novelty because I want more than that, Frank. I want more fans to come out. I want the fans that weren't able to get out or take that, that opportunity on that weekend to check us out and see what we got going on. It's going to be high flying. It's going to be fun. Uh, it's going to be football. They're going to like it. The rules are going to be great. It's going to be exciting. So be with us Friday night for Five on Your Sideline. Our game of the week is going to be on the east side. Mascuda will be at Highland. The joint will be jumping in a really good rivalry game. Speaking of rivalry games, undefeated Francis Howe will host Howe North on Friday, and North better be ready to deal with one of the most electric receivers in town. Six foot three, 200 pound Jude James. He's averaging 22 yards a catch. Number six just took a visit to Notre Dame a few weeks ago. An honor student, a three sport athlete, and committed to greatness. Uh, I've been playing this game since I was in second grade, you know, and just like I just want to keep building and just keep being better. I want to make it to that next level and uh, after there, see what happens. You're just a tremendous athlete and, and a good kid, a competitor, a kid that gets after it and, and uh, is bought in academically, just great. Teachers love him for who he is with his character and those things. One of the great football schools in our state, they pack it up. They have 125 people in their program. They are amazing. All right, Frank, thanks. Move over, moon. The sun has a spooky side, too. The Halloween treat for stargazers. The sun set hours ago, but earlier today, it showed it was in the Halloween spirit. NASA telescopes captured these images. Some on Twitter say it looks like a jack-o'-lantern. Others say it resembles the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man from Ghostbusters. The dark splotches are actually cooler sections of the sun. Cool. They celebrated Halloween with a twist at Mercy St. Louis. They held a reverse trick-or-treating event for pediatric patients. 
For the first time since COVID, doctors, nurses, and other hospital employees dressed up and delivered treats to their rooms. And it's a weather first weather alert day tomorrow. Here's Scott. Yeah, because of the dense fog that's continuing to develop and spread now in the Metro East, we're seeing that fog and the visibility is down around a quarter of a mile from northern St. Charles County, West Alton, over towards Alton, then down towards Belleville, Sparta, up towards Litchfield. So that impacts the commute for tomorrow morning. And as a consequence of that, we have a dense fog advisory that's in effect for most of our Illinois counties until 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. So give yourself a little extra time out the door Tuesday. And there you have it. Five on your side at 10. The Tonight Show starring Jimmy Fallon is next. Jimmy's guest tonight, Harry Potter himself, actor Daniel Radcliffe. Have a great tomorrow.